to you from the Forge of Freedom studio in the heart of America, a podcast dedicated to preserving freedom and inspiring personal success. Freedom is born and lives through you, the individual, and it dies in the shadows of tyranny, motivating our listeners to become well-rounded, freedom-minded people with the body of an athlete, the mind of a stoic, and the spirit of a warrior. The Tree of Liberty lives on through you, the Forge of Freedom. And now, here's your host, Alex Uli. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Forge of Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Alex Uli, and this is episode 30 of the Forge of Freedom. Today, I have my father, Mike Uli, back in the studio for Monday, Gun Day, to discuss uh, Jeff Cooper and the Combat Triad. Welcome to the show again, Mike. Hey, Alex. Good to be here. So... You and I are both firearms instructors. We're both attorneys, and we have been teaching firearms classes for close to a decade now. I'm not sure exactly when we when we started, and we always refer people to other uh, good instructors, and there are many great instructors nationwide, but one that we always refer to or always come back to is Jeff Cooper, and Jeff Cooper is no longer with us, but he's somebody that we we always come back to when we're when we're talking about sort of the the fundamentals of uh, gunfighting and and marksmanship and uh, sort of the modern pistol technique um, so I guess starting off you wanted to say a little bit about who Jeff Cooper is and, and why we talk about him yeah boy this is a, a tough one to con- consolidate the history of Jeff Cooper uh, down to its and, and down to its impact on what we do today in terms of training, but I'm going to start. It's kind of funny. I went back to get prepared for this a little bit. I went back and got my copy of uh, Jeff Cooper's Principles of Personal Defense. I don't know if folks can see this or not, or if it shows up. It's backwards on what I'm seeing here. I don't yeah. know. You can make the technology work, maybe, but it's just a it's a short book actually, and I think he refers to it as as, as an essay actually. But it's sort of funny. I was thinking about this. Is it's a small book. Um, but I think it's probably one of the most important books that someone preparing themselves to be proficient in arms ought to read, uh, and certainly instructors should read it. Um, it's sort of funny that uh, also when I was going through that it's right next to this other book by Masada Yub in The Greatest Extreme, and it's also a rather slim book, um, but it's packed. They're both packed full of great information. Uh, Masad's book is called In the Greatest Extreme, and it's kind of an older book, I think, maybe his first book, uh, but still my favorite and incredibly relevant today. But anyway, let's get back to Jeff Cooper a little bit. I thought to kind of give you a flavor of what Jeff Cooper was like is maybe I don't like to read to people, but I think that uh, Jeff Cooper's own words are probably a better reflection and explanation of who he was than uh, what I could say. First of all, I want to tell you this, that Jeff Cooper was a retired U.S. Marine Corps officer. He was a combat veteran from World War II in the Korean War. He passed at the age of 85, 86 years old in about 2006. His wife, who I think uh, her name was Janelle, um, they were married forever. I don't remember how long, um, but she passed, I think, in 2019. And if you ever went to Gunsight, and I'll talk about Gunsight here in a minute, um, but folks would even after Colonel Cooper passed, they would still go to their the residence there and uh, meet with his wife uh, after the 250 pistol course. We'll get to that in a little bit. But let me read a little bit of what Jeff Cooper, and I apologize to read to people, but I think it's important. Um, He says, violent crime is feasible only if its victims are cowards. A victim who fights back makes the whole business impractical. It is true that a victim who fights back may suffer for it, but one who does not almost certainly will suffer for it. And suffer or not, the one who fights back retains his dignity and his self-respect. Any study of the atrocities, and he goes into some atrocities, Uh, shows immediately that the victims, by their appalling ineptitude and and timidity, virtually assisted in their own murders. Don't make them mad, Martha, so they won't hurt us. That reminds me of what I hear today in the modern media a lot of of times. You know this. I get just so upset with this. Not upset, but it bugs me. I hear this term, it was surreal. That's a reflection of folks who aren't prepared for possible 
bad things in life, atrocities, uh, crimes. And I think that's what Colonel Cooper was alluding to here. He goes on to say, any man who is a man may not, in honor, submit to threats or violence. But many men who are not cowards are simply unprepared for the fact of human savagery. They have not thought about it. Incredibly as this may appear to anyone who reads the paper or listens to the news, and they just don't know what to do. When they look right into the face of depravity or violence, they are astonished and confounded. This can be corrected. These are the people we hear today use that word. It was surreal. The techniques of personal combat are not covered in this work. The so-called martial arts, boxing, karate, he goes into others, the pistol, are complete studies in themselves and must be acquired through suitable programs of instruction, training, and practice. It behooves all able-bodied men and women to consider them, but the subject of this work is more basic than technique. Being a study of the guiding principles of survival in the face of unprovoked violence or the part of ex extra-legal human assailants, strategy and tactics are subordinate to the principles of war, just as individual defensive combat is subordinate to the following principles of personal defense. So he mentions technique here. You mentioned the mod modern technique, but these are the principles of personal defense. He talks about technique, and that's why he, that's why he founded Gunsight, was to address the technique in part. Just one last thing, his seven principles of personal defense. I happened to find my notes from reading the book, or it may have been from my Gunsight, actually attending the Gunsight training. But the seven principles, just so you know, we won't go into them. Alertness, decisiveness, aggressiveness, speed, coolness, ruthlessness. And surprise. I won't go into what those all meant to him. You'll have to read his book if you want an explanation. But I think this book start is the cornerstone or the bed upon which the modern technique uh, was uh, advanced. And I think what people will notice through our discussion and also if they read his, his book or his essay, um, Principles of the Personal Defense, is that Jeff Cooper, like so many great instructors, doesn't focus just on how to shoot a firearm. I mean, he, the, the emphasis, the basis of what they teach is more about that mindset so that when you are encountered with violence, when you are attacked by the savage savagery of, of other human beings, that you're prepared to face that and win that fight. Yep. And, and, and to be able to win that fight, you have to, you have to understand and put into effect these principles he talks about in his book, um, and you also have to have the technical things down too, the modern technique as well. One last thing I want to read just for you, because I'm, I'm a George Patton fan as well, but he has a little quote in here or a, a little uh, piece of information about George Patton. Uh, Colonel Cooper says, George, Pat George Patton told his officers, don't worry about your flanks. Let the enemy worry about his flanks. It is high time for society to stop worrying about the criminal and to let the criminal start worrying about society. And by society, I mean you. And he's talking about criminals there, the real criminals, not these. He's talking about people that take property or injure or kill other people. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about a criminal. He's not talking about these. You had a podcast not long ago, these victimless crimes out there. These, what was your podcast called? Vices uh, are not crimes. Vices are not crimes. Go back and listen to that, folks. Um, but that's what Colonel Cooper was talking about when he quoted George Patton there. In any event, um, I'll get to the point here about what the modern technique is. Modern uh, technique was developed uh, in the context of these pr uh, principles of personal defense. And he formed Gunsight in uh, 1976, and I think it was called API, which stands for, stood for American Pistol Institute, I think it stood for it. Eventually, the name was changed to Gunsight, G-U-N-S-I-T-E. -E. It's still there today in uh, near Paulden, Arizona, which is in central Arizona. Um, and you can go there today. Um, the Ken Campbell, interesting enough, who I took a course with, actually when he was still sheriff in Boone County, Indiana, is the current CEO, and Buzz Mills is the owner of Gunsight. And I read a little article just the other day. I think they've had a great I think they're expanding and folks are going out there and training. There's a lot of interest in training out there. Uh, and I think you, I should mention, I think probably uh, it's the premier um, uh, 
gunfighting school in the country. They train military and then they train civilians, both law enforcement civilians and private citizens as well. Um, of course, the uh, Clint Smith with Thunder Ranch up in Oregon is also up there. And there are others too, but Gunsight, I think, is probably thought of as the premier uh, training school in the uh, world. So anyway. Um, one, one thing you mentioned too, I, I just... I'd like to interject and tell a quick story about another uh, excellent firearms instructor who has also passed. Um, but but your comments about people who who face life or death situations and, and their reaction is, oh, it was surreal. I, I didn't think this could happen to me. Uh, they don't have that mindset that this could happen to me and I know what to do. We took a class of several years ago with Dennis Reichert, who I, 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 I never met Jeff Cooper, but my me either for the me either for the record my impression was that Dennis Riker was a lot like Jeff Cooper in 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 some ways um and he told us this story about uh, a female that he interacted with on several occasions at a local restaurant uh here in Indiana mm -hmm. and how she had been involved in this on again off uh, again re relationship with a, a violent person and how he on so many occasions uh, it tried to encourage her to learn how to, to take up for herself, either with a firearm and, and, and training or in s some other way. And uh, he was a law enforcement officer. And he said, I did that until one day I got a call that she'd been attacked and I showed up and she'd nearly been decapitated. And with a tear in his eye, he, he, he felt remorse. He felt regret. He said, I just wish I would have tried a little harder to get it through to her that she needed to take her own safety into her, her hands and that so that she could have been ready because I think that I could have trained her to be prepared for that, that savagery. And, um, you know, so, so that's what Jeff Cooper is trying to prevent. That's what Dennis Riker was trying to prevent they realize that there is evil in the world and that people have to be prepared to face it and win. And that's, that's really the impetus behind the combat triad and the modern pistol technique. Yeah. And I remember your story. And now I recall your story about Dennis Reichert. He was a, a great trainer. He's no longer with us. He passed a number of years ago, but uh, yeah, I remember that story and um, what Jeff Cooper thought was that you needed a, an effective, safe and authoritative program of study to make you competent with a firearm. And a firearm was simply a tool. Uh, and it's a tool that allows us to control our environment if there are criminal, particularly if there are criminals in that environment uh, that are threatening us or other innocent people, our family, our loved ones. But it's, ju it's just a matter of being able to use that tool uh, uh, effectively. And we have to, had to study that. That's one thing Jeff Cooper did en enormously. Uh, and to come up with a program that would allow us to train as many people as we can so that they were competent with arm, arms, responsible with arms, safe with arms, and could use it at that moment when sometimes only a firearm is the answer. I mean, violence is never, we always say um, violence is never the answer uh, until it is the only answer. Um, and sometimes that's the case. We don't like that, but sometimes that's the case. And this, this particular show is not a podcast about advocating for, for firearms necessarily. Um, it, people have to make that own choice on their own, but what's so amazing about firearms is that they are the greatest equalizer. If you're, uh, if you're weak, if you're infirm, if you're old and somebody intends to do you harm, firearms level the playing field. And that female who was nearly decapitated may have had a chance to survive if she had been prepared. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean with a firearm, but a firearm is a, a great tool if you're trained and responsible. Yep. And like I said, previously, Colonel Cooper, there are principles of personal defense that we have to understand and we have to implement. But we also need to understand that there's this modern technique, which, by the way, this is not – if you train with somebody and you don't see at least – some, if not a lot of the modern technique taught by that instructor, 
probably ought to be thinking about your instructors in my estimation. That doesn't mean your instructors necessarily had to attend gun site, although that would be a great thing. Um, but if you don't see this modern technique and what you're being taught, might need to think about what you're being taught. Um, cause these principles, many of them, at least not all or most are still applicable today. All right. So you want to go ahead and sure. jump in and, and keep in mind that, yeah, Colonel Cooper, what he thought is you needed to have speed, accuracy, and a uh, power to win that confrontation, to be able to control that environment. So he came up with the modern technique, which combines mental conditioning, gun handling, and marksmanship so that we'll have the speed, power, and accuracy necessary to control that environment that we need to control. Um, and one other thing that he kind of talked about, he said, and I may not have this exactly right, but owning a piano does not make you a musician uh, any more than owning a handgun makes you a good shooter. So that's why he wanted to teach this modern technique. Um, and he came up with this technique that consisted kind of at its core, this what call, what's called the combat triad. And it's a set of principles that were developed by Colonel Cooper. And this combat triad consists of three main, well, not three main elements, three elements, period, in a discussion, hard stop. And it's mindset, which is probably the most important. Um, it's also gun handling and marksmanship. Those are the three parts of the combat triad. And think of a triangle. you got marksmanship, gun handling at the bottom, kind of the base is mindset. Yeah, if you think about it like the, the food pyramid, you know, it, it's the, the mindset is the large portion at the bottom of the triangle. And then marksmanship and gun handling above that. Yeah. And, you know, I think what's important to understand is uh, much of this, particularly the gun handling and the mind, the gun handling and the marksmanship, we have to do these in a repetitive nature so that they become second nature to us. I don't, I don't remember what they call the hierarchy. We need to get these skills to a level so that they're, they are There's, unconsciously competent. Yeah. You can talk about there, that a little bit. St uh, some people call it stages of skill development, but basically some people say there are five, but we generally uh, say four. There is unconscious incompetence, uh, conscious competence and uh, unconscious competence, which I missed one in there. there there's generally four, but, um, well, there's unconscious, unconscious, in, comp incompetence. Yeah. Unconscious incompetence. Yes. Yeah, yep. Conscious incompetence. That's the one I missed and, uh, conscious competence and then unconscious competence. So that's what we want. An unconscious competence is when a skill becomes second nature. It's, it's Michael Jordan shooting a jump shot. He's not thinking about mm -hmm where the placement of his hand is on the ball, where his feet are, how he's squared up to the basket, where, when he jumps, as he releases the ball, he's not thinking about any of those things. It just happens um, second nature because he's done it so many times. He's developed the mile and sheath, the, the neural pathways to, to perform that skill without thinking about it. So that's what we're talking about when it comes to uh, gun handling and marksmanship in particular but also with mindset to some degree as well, uh, because you, you don't want to have to think about how you're going to act when you're faced with that confrontation. Yep. And so if we talk about the three areas of the, the combat triad, the, ma the uh, mindset, the marksmanship and the gun handling, kind of the first thing we'll talk about maybe a little bit is the marksmanship. And with respect to the modern technique, um, some of the things that I think that, that feed the marksmanship element here is what's called the weaver stance. That's what Colonel Cooper taught, or at least one of the things that uh, was taught at gun sight, still taught at gun sight. But there are, there's the weaver uh, stance and it's, it's sort of an isometric. Um, it's hard to do this on a video. You, we have to demonstrate this in class, how to, how to assume the weaver stance, but it's a muscle. It's isometric or ISO. What's the word I'm looking for? ISO. Okay. Uh, I think it yeah, isometric. Tension. It's where you have tension, muscle on muscle, basically is what it is. You're not locking out necessarily your elbows. Um, so that's one of the things that he taught uh, based upon his observation, his experience. Uh, the presentation, which is basically drawing a holster or drawing from a holster and uh, getting to the point where your sights are aligned on target. Um, he taught uh, the flash sight picture, which is what I like to describe as not letting uh, perfect be the enemy of good. In other words, uh, we want to, uh, once again, we want to work on speed. And that means when we see that front sight uh, in the center of the target, um, that's good enough 
for combat accuracy at that juncture. We don't have to perfectly align the front sight and the rear sight um, on the target. So anyway, that's a, another thing, the flash sight picture, the compressed surprise break, and that has to do with the trigger press. Um, that needs, you know, the, when the gun goes off, it needs to be a surprise so that we don't anticipate and jerk the, jerk the trigger and jerk the gun, which is why most right-handed inexperienced or new shooters will, uh, pull the pull and shoot low and left. And then also he talked about in terms of, he always talked about the heavy duty pistol, which needed to be a pistol that could suffer the rigor, suffer the rigors of combat and still work. But, but the goal of marksmanship is getting good hits on target consistently yep. right so all these things you're talking about uh, all these techniques uh within marksmanship are about getting good hits on target quickly yep and if you go to gun site or by the way they have off-site courses as well um i think they, they have well indiana they have some there's Nashville. i think they have in colorado i'm not sure you have to get on their website but uh you know, this stuff is taught over in the 250 course is taught over the course of a week. So um, it's difficult in a little podcast here to go over these things or demonstrate them. But the other thing is gun handling. Uh, and I think that's important as well. And it encompasses basically the safe and efficient manipulation of the firearm. OK. Um, and what we want to do with that, I think, is we want uh, is we want to emphasize the word efficient and we want to eliminate I know Tiger used to talk about this. Tiger McKee, um, who also has passed, unfortunately, as we've talked about previously, but he always talked about efficiency, and that's basically eliminating unnecessary movement. That's what efficiency is, and that's how we get speed. Now, we don't get speed by just trying to do a lot of stuff very fast. We get speed by eliminating unnecessary movement, and that's what we mean by and that's what I mean by efficiency anyway. So marksmanship is about getting good hits on target. Gun handling is about safely and efficiently handling, manipulating the firearm. Yeah, it's about presenting the firearm. It's about dealing with malfunctions. It's about reholstering. It's about shooting from retention. It's about taking how to handle a type one and type two malfunctions. It's about tactical reloads. It's about all kinds of things that we need to do with the firearms. It's about firing from kneeling. It's about potentially firing from prone. It's about firing when you're moving. It's about 90 degree turns and firing. It's about a hundred and you know, those sorts of things all uh, touch on the, uh, the gun handling aspects. Okay. So I, th I think in terms of the, the triad, we're kind of moving down the triangle toward the bottom here. And the last one we're, we're leading to here is mindset. Yeah. And one thing I want to say about kind of gun handling that this kind of where I pigeonhole this, the safety anyway, is, um, and Colonel Cooper had the four rules for safe gun handling. He's gun I and mean, he said them a little differently than I do. Uh, just a, just a tad, but principally they're exactly the same in principle. Uh, but he always talked about all guns are always loaded. Um, I generally say treat all guns as if they're loaded, but same principle. Um, never let the muzzle cover anything you're not willing to destroy. I kind of internalize that as always keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. Um, and then he also said, keep your finger off the trigger to your sights or on target. Um, that's the golden rule. Um, I kind of say that is, um, you know, um, make sure you keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire. Um, and identify your tiger target and what's beyond it. I kind of think of that as not only what's beyond it, but what's in front of it, what's beside it. You have to know your target and what's around it. There's no question like about that. So th he was very, very obviously a very big proponent of the four um, um, basic rules of firearm safety, which yeah. I think is part of the gun, part of everything. But yeah, part, part of, of everything, gun, but but um, mostly part of the gun handling uh, part of the triad, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, all right, and then finally, mindset. So we've talked about marksmanship. We've talked about gun handling. The third component of the combat triad is mindset. You want to say a little something about mindset, Mike? Yeah, uh, he thought, I think he thought, I mean, that it was the most critical component. That's why we see principles of personal defense in part. Um, but if, if we have the right mindset, we can uh, adapt or react to an incredibly high stress situation in a competent manner, in a cool, remember I mentioned coolness? We got to be decisive. We got to be cool. Those things from the principles of personal defense, um, but it allows us to act, react to a situation, life or death situation competently, 
rather than simply relying upon luck. Uh, and granted, sometimes we can just be lucky. Sometimes the probabilities are with us. Um, at the same time, sometimes we're completely con people may be completely competent and things may not work out. But it's all about raising the odds in our favor so that we can react competently. Um, one of the things he thought we ought to have the mental and psychological preparation to basically deal with combat or a personal uh, uh, attack uh, and to be able to deal with potential threats. But one of the things about mindset that he was very um, big on was awareness. And that's important because if we're aware, we can we always teach we want to avoid a self-defense situation or the use of deadly force if we can. We always want to be aware and then be able to avoid a situation because that's actually a win. But he, and I'm not going to go into all of these today, but one of the things that he preached and taught was the color uh, code uh, levels of awareness. And he had uh, three color or four color codes. Some people put a, f a fifth one in there now. But he had the uh, white, and that's where we're re relaxed and unaware, unprepared. And he taught us how to be um, aware of a situation based upon these color codes and what we ought to do in each one of these color codes. Okay, white, we're completely unaware. Yellow is a general state of awareness where we're relaxed. We can be in that situation almost all the time. We should almost never be in the, in the uh, level of white, which is where we're completely unaware of what's going on in our environment. Yellow, we can stay there. It's easy to maintain. And then he talked about orange, and that's where there may be a specific alert, you, you know, where we notice something. We may hear something at night, you know, the front door, somebody trying to get in. We may hear something. We think it might be somebody coming in the front door. We may see somebody that's a little suspicious. You know, they've got a trench coat on in July. Uh, in the bank or whatever. Um, and then he talked about uh, condition red, a color code red. And that's where we have a, a kind of a, a trigger. That's when we're going to be decisive. We're going to take action and be aggressive. If the person after I tell them to stop three times in the Walmart parking lot doesn't stop and they continue towards me with that knife in their hand, you know, I'm going to do whatever my plan is depending on the circumstances at that juncture. So anyway, that's the color codes. It's a whole lecture at Gunsight about the color codes and how to use them in your life to be aware and avoid situations. But that was one of the most important things that Colonel Cooper, Colonel Cooper taught with respect to the minus portion of the combat triad. Yeah, so, so that, that awareness component is obviously a huge component of mindset because, like you said, it, it helps us to avoid the situation it gives us a better chance of avoiding the situation if at all possible, because that's really the only win uh, in a in a life or death encounter is to is to avoid is to avoid it entirely. But mindset is it's more than just awareness, right? I mean, it, there's there's more to it than that, and we alluded to it a little bit earlier when we talked about being mentally prepared for that life or death situation, so that you can take the action that you need to take to survive uh, so that you don't go into that flight or fight or uh, flight fight or freeze response and freeze because the more you're mentally prepared for it the more likely you are to not uh, uh, experience one of those uh, fight flight or freeze responses especially the freeze which is what we don't definitely don't want right absolutely so um, so there's awareness, there's the mental preparation component. Uh, we talk about, uh, we teach a, a five hour legal seminar. There's also sort of the, the legal aspect that you have to be prepared for mentally. I, am I authorized in using force? Am I authorized in using deadly force uh, in the current situation? So you have to be prepared, know those things ahead of time because you're, you're facing potentially murder charges if you use force unlawfully. So th there's a lot that goes into this, this mindset. You want to say uh, anything else about mindset there, Mike? Yeah. I mean, the mindset uh, is so incredibly important. Once again, we want to be that person that doesn't say it was surreal. We want to be that person that says, I knew this can happen and I know what to do. Yeah. and be able to process the situation and make the decision about whether I must use deadly force or not. And I think it's important um, to understand that when we're talking about the gun handling and the marksmanship, so much of that, that our, our ability there and our skills there need to be honed to the level 
where we are unconsciously competent with respect to those, for instance, gun handling skills, the marksmanship skills, so that when we're faced with that life or death situation, we can apply these mindset rules or lessons that we that we learn. Uh, and those are going to have to be more cognitive. We're going to have to sort out the situation. We're going to have to apply our cognitive skills at the time and think about them and do problem solving. That's why we want those gun handling and those marksmanship skills to be at that unconscious competence level so that our brain doesn't have to cognitively think about those things and we can process the scene and what we need to do from a legal standpoint. And the more you have to think about, the more likely you are to sh just shut down, to just freeze because you don't know what to do. You're so overwhelmed uh, with, with decisions, decisions that you have to make. So like you said, that's why it's so important to have those marksmanship and gun handling skills uh, to become second nature. But uh, that mindset is so like it, it really is. To, to a great extent, you'll see that, like I said, I'd recommend folks read this book, Principles of Personal Defense. You'll see a lot of the mindset uh, lessons in that book. Yeah. And I'm also going to link to, in the show notes, uh, Jeff Cooper's commentaries. There are a series of essays that Gunsight collected uh, and put on the Internet. I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. So if people are interested in reading those commentaries, I think there's a lot of uh, wisdom and knowledge to be gained in those commentaries as well. I'll also link to a copy of this book, Principles of Personal Defense. And I also, I want to mention too here with respect to mindset, and Mike, you can chime in, chime in on this too. I, I think a great way to mentally prepare for that life or death situation is, is to visualize it and to think about what sorts of situations you might find yourself in and how you would respond. Because Let's face it, most of us don't face life or death situations day to day. We don't get to practice these things day to day unless you're going to force on force training uh, or some other hands on training like that. But a great resource to help you visualize these sorts of situations is the Active Self Protection a YouTube channel with John Correa. And he gets. Uh, security footage primarily or from homes and businesses. And he, he analyzes footage of uh, life or death situations where people use force to, de to defend themselves. And he analyzes what the people, what the attacker does, what the victim does, what, what they uh, may have done differently, what things you may have noticed or might have paid attention to, to, to avoid it entirely. Uh, so these are great videos to watch to visualize these so that you can think about how you would respond in those situations if you were involved yeah i mean to the extent we can we want to submit ourselves to as many situations as we can where we have to think about the decision we would make in a particular situation so when we see a video of someone making decisions in a life or death situation and we think about what we would or wouldn't do in that scenario that helps us if we're ever faced with a life or death situation ourselves, once again, we want to be the person that doesn't say, Hey, this was surreal. We want to be the person that says, I know, I knew this could happen and I know what to do. Um, so it's, a, it's a really good idea to do the visualization. Um, of course, Colonel, Co Colonel Cooper didn't have the benefit of YouTube. Yeah. Um, but it, it's also good if you can, I mean, if you go to gun site or take one of their, their two fifty class, for instance, I um, mean, they take you through a shoot house and there's a lot of shoot, no shoot situations uh, where you really make decisions with a firearm in a, tra in a safe training environment. So yeah. uh, that's even better. Yeah. So. All right. So I, I think we're about to, to wrap it up here. We've talked about visualization and we've referred to a few books and a YouTube channel with active self-protection. Are there any other things you'd like to mention, Mike, about uh, what what people might look to in terms of resources, uh, maybe any tips that, that you might have with respect to how that people should develop each uh, part of the combat triad in their own training or their own uh, personal development? Well, I think the, once again, I mean, read the book, go to Gunsight's website, take a, take a look at that. If you can, I mean, the best thing to do is to go to Gunsight actually for a week. Um, and I don't get, I'm not affiliated with Gunsight at all, at all, but I'm endorsing that. And they do have some, some on, 
some on uh, offsite uh, training as well. But I think that you uh, need to find a, uh, a firearms instructor. I think instruction is good, formal instruction, if you can do that. Um, find, and find somebody that at least is pretty familiar with the modern technique and what's taught at Gunsight, whether or not they teach exactly the same thing uh, or not. I mean, the Weaver stance, I would tell you, I know what it is. I don't use the Weaver stance. Um, there's what's called the Chapman or the modified Weaver. That's what I'm sort of inclined to do. Uh, there's the isosceles, but make sure that your instructor at least understands some of the history of Jeff Cooper. Um, and, you know, you're just going to, you know, you just have to uh, make some decisions based upon your own individual situation about, you know, m money. It's expensive. It's expensive to go to guns. I probably, I think it's up to close to $2,000 for the 250 class and you got ammunition and you're staying. So maybe you have to find somebody local if that's not in your budget, but make sure you find somebody that's uh, fam at least familiar with the concepts. Yeah. I think there are lots of great instructors, but when you're looking for an instructor, especially if it's one more local, if you can't afford to go to Gunsight, which is uh, totally understandable. Uh, so many, most people probably can't afford to take the time and money to go to Gunsight, but at least try to find an instructor that has either been to Gunsight or is familiar with the training that they've given and has trained under somebody else who's trained at Gunsight or has trained with Masada Ayub or Range Master and Tom Givens or some other reputable instructor. And uh, if you have questions about that, it, it can be kind of hard to sift through some of this information because there are lots of great resources out there on the internet, like so many things, but there are also lots of terrible resources out there on the internet. Uh, but uh, those are all great places to start. Gunsight, Range Master, um, what was it? Range Master, Thunder Ranch. Thunder Ranch with Vince uh, yeah, Smith, yeah. with uh, John Farnham travels around, does training. Yeah. There are lots of folks Active that do. Active self-protection, John Korea. Yeah, and, and another place I would commend you to to read uh, that is also provides some opportunities, Greg Elifritz. He has a great website. Excellent. He has a weekly, what's he call his weekly thing where he does the dump? Uh, uh, weekly the, knowledge dump. Yeah, he uh, scans the, I think scans the internet all week and kind of sorts out all the, 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 the junk. From the good stuff and he says hey read this and that's it's probably great. the single best resource to look to is that because he sifts through the good and the bad information and gives you the best information that he finds on a weekly basis yeah and he's and i absolutely trust him to sift through it too yeah, yeah. i mean he's got the he's got the knowledge skills attitude to sift through it and if he says it's a good thing you ought to read it then it's a good thing you ought to read it in my mind so that's a great place to go um we had a class with greg elfritz and uh He's passed away too. Um, uh, William April. William April. I'm sorry about that. Um, awesome. William April. Uh, and it was a great class. It was a two day class, I think it was, or something I like that. I think so, yeah. But anyway, William April was a, gr a great instructor and storyteller. I enjoyed him in enormously. And we took a class with Greg Elifritz. And I don't know where I'm going with this, except to, to tell you that uh, I know Greg Elifritz does have some training uh, throughout the year as well, um, prob mostly in the Midwest, I think think well, he's based in ohio he does travel but it's mostly in the midwest region yeah and he and there may and don't go look at his website he may go in his way, website all kinds of places that active I don't know response about. training and i'll link to that in the show notes as well yeah so all right well i think uh unless you've got any last words to say mike i think that's where we'll we'll leave the subject for now but uh, i hope people learned a little bit about jeff cooper and and the combat triad and the importance, really, when we want to emphasize the importance of mindset when it comes to firearms, uh, self-defense, and being prepared for that life or death situation, being prepared to survive the gunfight. Yeah, and I think just one last thing. I mean, I think so many people get their notions about what a violent encounter is going to be like from TV, from movies, from Hollywood. And I would submit to you... For the most part, that's giving you a poor impression. And you mentioned active self-protection. I mean, you have to really vet the sources that you use for training and information and knowledge. Yep. Yep. All right, Mike. Well, thanks for joining us again. Uh, I hope listeners, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to give it a, a thumbs up and subscribe to help us spread the message of freedom. Next week, uh, or actually later this week, I'll be releasing an episode 
with Donald Rainwater. He's the libertarian candidate for governor here in Indiana. I hope you'll tune in for that. I think you'll find his ideas for Indiana to be compelling and interesting. And, and even if you're not from Indiana, I think you'll find his ideas are probably relevant to the to the country as a whole and to the state that you live in. So keep an eye out for that episode. Can I say something about that? Probably totally uninformed, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> and I would defer to you on this, but so many times it seems like, quote, libertarians with a capital L, the folks that are part of the Libertarian Party, at least in my mind, it's like they don't seem to really be libertarian to me in, in terms of comparing it to libertarian principles with a little L. Um, this gentleman seems to be more consistent with a libertarian little L. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think that what you'll find about Donald Rainwater too, if you, if you tune in for that show is that his ideas are practical, they can be implemented. They don't get rid of government entirely, but they peel back the layers of government that we have because we have far too much government in the world that we currently live in. So I, I think he's not only, uh, a libertarian in terms of uh, with a little L with being consistent with the little L principles of libertarianism, but he's also practical, not sort of a, what so many people perceive to be sort of out of touch libertarians when the, the ones who run for, for government office anyway. So I, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, definitely keep an eye out for that and tune in for that. Yeah, next I week. think he got like 12, 13% of the, Vote in the primary uh, against Hulk, Holcomb and he, the rest he, of the crew. He got a significant vote, uh, largely in response to the way that our current governor handled uh, COVID and the the lockdown and, and things there. So uh, I think he's a great candidate, and I hope you turn in, tune in for that. Until then, remember, you are the Forge of Freedom. <laughs>